Good morning, everyone. I'm Rebecca Nickmeyer, and I'm very delighted to be talking to you today about the Organization for Imaging Genomics in Infancy. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to try and tell you who we are, what we've learned, what we hope to do in the future, and how that might be relevant to cerebral palsy. So who are we? Origins includes investigators from different centers around the world, all engaged in neuroimaging research focused on infancy and early childhood. So kind of the overarching goal, the long-term goal, is to determine how both genetic and environmental factors influence the development of brain morphometry, anatomical and functional connectivity, and cognitive and emotional function uh, from birth to age six. Uh, since I founded this uh, group in 2017, we've grown to include about 30 members representing 17 institutions. Uh, that includes 21 different cohorts of infants and young children, uh, adding up to over 6,000 in total, uh, most with longitudinal imaging data and many with behavioral data. Uh, you can see our geographical spread there in the bottom one. Uh, so it is still heavily weighted towards the United States, but we do also have participants in Germany, the UK, uh, Finland, Singapore, and South Africa. And we're always looking for new cohorts and new individuals to come in. Now we are embedded in an even larger network called Enigma, which is uh, a lovely acronym for Enhancing Neuroimaging uh, Genetics via Meta-Analysis. Uh, despite the name, it is not exclusively focused on genetics. Uh, so what you see in the picture here are uh, 50 odd working groups that are involved in Enigma. So you can see there are groups that are focused on a range of psychiatric and neurological disorders. There are groups focused on methods development for neuroimaging data. Uh, we're part of a uh, sort of core focus on healthy variation and aging. And then the genomics group actually does include, for example, an epigenetics group. Um, and I don't think it's represented here. There's also an environmental exposures group fairly recently founded. Um, I noticed that cerebral palsy is not on here. Uh, new working groups are starting all the time. So it's possible there is a newer nation group that I'm not yet aware of. Um, I'm going to follow up with Paul Thompson. Uh, the leader of Enigma after this, but it does seem like that would be a really a wonderful area to use this kind of model in. So we were very happy uh, about a year and a half ago to receive NIH funding to create the largest and uh, most diverse imaging genetics data set ever focused on this early period of life. Uh, so we're aiming for a target sample size of 6,809 kids. Uh, the grant funds three specific aims, which are kind of shown here in schematic. Uh, the first aim is really focused on harmonizing genetic imaging and behavioral data across these very diverse cohorts that obviously were founded without this effort in mind um, and that used different kinds of techniques. Uh, if you're interested, you can kind of see the, the numbers of kids we're expecting after we do harmonization and quality control for each of these different components. Aim two is really our genetic aim. Uh, so one of the first things we're interested in is just looking at uh, the heritability and genetic correlations of a range of neuroimaging phenotypes. So we're generating data on uh, regional brain volumes, on cortical thickness and surface area, on white matter connectivity, on functional connectivity. And it's going to be able to address some really fundamental questions, for example, about which uh, phenotypes are more strongly genetic and which may be more strongly environmental. Uh, as well as how they relate to each other. Uh, so we don't treat them all as kind of discrete entities. Uh, they're obviously interrelated. Uh, we'll be doing a standard uh, genome-wide association analysis to identify genes and variants that explain individual variation in the different phenotypes. And I'm so grateful to Renee for talking so beautifully about trajectories, because our goal really is to model the trajectory for every child. And instead of looking at just a cross-sectional measure, to be looking at things like intercept, asymptote, how rapidly a child reaches the asymptote. So it really is growth parameters. We're calling them DIPs, which is developmental imaging phenotypes. Uh, we'll also be integrating our data with data from the psychiatric GWAS consortium to see how the genes we identify overlap with genes that have already been robustly associated with things like schizophrenia, autism, and ADHD. Uh, aim three is our behavioral aim. So we're going to be looking to identify correlations between the developmental imaging phenotypes and clinically salient behaviors, uh, focusing on aggression, anxiety, and cognitive control for this grant. So 
So I'm going to show you some data, sort of GWAS proof of concept study that we did before Origins even existed. Uh, so this is on a much smaller set of data, about 800 kids in a prospective longitudinal study at UNC led by John Gilmore. This picture is up there. Uh, and this was a GWAS of intracranial volume, as well as white matter, gray matter, and CSF. And white matter may be particularly interesting uh, for cerebral palsy, obviously, because it's an area that's often damaged. Uh, we did see that common genetic variants were associated with neonatal brain volumes. Uh, for the gray matter phenotype, we actually have a genome-wide significant hit. Uh, it's a intronic SNP uh, in a gene called IGFBP7. A SNP is just a single nucleotide polymorphism, so a single base change uh, that's common in the population. This is a gene implicated in learning and memory, which is interesting. Uh, we were actually even more interested. It's about 500, within 500 KB of a gene called REST, which is what we call a master negative relator, a regulator of neurogenesis. So it actually suppresses genes involved in the development of neurons in cells that aren't going to turn into neurons. So its regulation is very important in early development. We have a, a SNP that just fell short of genome-wide significance for the white matter phenotype. And it's actually a gene called WWOX, which interestingly in the adult human brain is pretty much exclusively expressed in axons. So it makes sense with this kind of white matter phenotype. Uh, we also have looked at white matter specifically using diffusion tensor imaging. Um, so you can see here in the picture on the left, this is a model of some of the major association tracks in an infant brain. Um, and what we did, because it was a small sample, we couldn't look at all 47 tracks that are in our atlas. Uh, we developed a latent measure of white matter microstructure. And you can kind of see this in the circle plot, uh, that this measure explains, uh, it correlates highly with each individual tract, and it explains most of the heritable variation across the tracks. You can see our top hits uh, in the table there. One is genome-wide significant. Uh, that's in a gene called PSMF1, uh, which is involved in the, I mispronounce this, the ubiquinin uh, protease system, uh, interacts with the 26S protease. So it's adding to a growing literature on the role of that system in white matter development. And many of the other top hits are known to have roles in axon guidance, in fasciculation and pathfinding, in axon growth, uh, one's linked to myelination. Uh, PSMF1's also been linked to Angelman syndrome, which we think is very interesting. And uh, set BP1 down here is a high confidence ASD associated gene as well. If you look around the bottom, one of the nice things about tractography is we can then go back and see how this looks in different regions. So what you may notice, the bright red here is significant uh, and the blue is non-significant. So the non-significant regions are really things sort of at the base and center of the brain. And these are the areas that are early myelinating. So my suspicion is that we've picked up genes that are related to earlier developmental processes like exonogenesis. And as we move forward into looking later in development, the neonate will be able to pick up genes and pathways related to early myelination. So while we were pursuing our grant funding, a wonderful postgraduate fellow of mine, Ann Alex, was working on a pilot project looking at subcortical volumes uh, in a group of about 2,000 kids from eight origins cohorts uh, with over 3,000 data points. And her goal was to define developmental trajectories for subcortical structures, see what the effects of socioeconomic status and obstetric history was, and then to correlate subcortical volumes with cognitive development. So first of all, and this was not to say surprising, uh, but we saw that the subcortical structures and ICV follow nonlinear growth patterns in early childhood. So they have huge increases and they kind of asymptote. Uh, but there's considerable regional heterogeneity in when they do that, which I think is interesting. And other studies have looked at this because of the sample size here. I think our estimates are probably more accurate than what's been done before. Uh, but we see that the amygdala, which is involved in things like responding to fear and emotional uh, stimuli is very early maturing, around three years of age. The hippocampus is crucial for episodic memory and spatial navigation, maturing a little later, around 4.6. Uh, basal ganglia structure is very important for motor coordination, as well as a range of cognitive skills, uh, a little later, between 4.6 and 5.5, depending on whether we're talking about caudate, putamen, or pallidum. And then interestingly, the thalamus was sort of major relay center 
in the brain, you know, taking symbols, signals from the periphery and lower brain regions to the cortex, uh, actually is predicted to mature after the age range of our study, around seven years of age. So that's kind of fascinating. We found that children born prematurely or those with low birth weight had reduced volumes at the intercept, that would be CHIRM. Again, not surprising, but it's good when you see the things you expect. Uh, but we also see later catching up when we go towards the asymptote. And I think this is interesting. There are a lot of studies suggesting persistent volume reductions in preterm children, in subcortical volumes and in other brain uh, volumes. But a lot of those studies are really driven by the extremely premature and very low birth weight population. Our sample is really weighted towards mid and late uh, preterm infants. So it's giving us some new information about them. Uh, I can't go all through the specifics of maternal education and income because they're actually different for different structures uh, and at different times. But what I will say is that for some of these, we see that SES is already having an impact at the intercept, normally in lower volumes, suggesting you would need to intervene prenatally in order to reduce those differences. But there are other structures where they're normal at birth, but then they deviate as the, as the children age, suggesting there's something about their postnatal environment uh, that is not allowing them to develop as rapidly. We also found, interestingly, or perhaps you'll not be surprised, that the brain cognition correlations were different in our preterm and our full-term children. We started out running this all together, uh, but saw that the cohorts were very different. They didn't seem to match the combined group. And we said, well, it looks like the ones with preterm infants are the different ones, so we'll split them apart. So you can see in the preterms, most of the correlations are positive. And I should say this is predicted volumes and predicted uh, Mullen scores at age two. So it's not cross-sectional in the sense that they were only measured then because we're using the trajectory to get the prediction. But obviously in the future, we're hoping to look at things like rate of change that I think are even better at capturing the longitudinal trajectories. But they're generally positive. The only one that's significant after multiple corrections is between visual reception and hippocampal volume in the preterms, but there's a general pattern. And I think that's probably because volume here is being driven by different factors than it is in the full term, possibly by damage, um, and that that's what's predicting the cognitive outcomes. In the full term, interestingly, you'll notice that some of the strongest correlations are negative. So in fact, lower volumes are associated with better performance. And this fits with some hypotheses that we and others have put forward before, suggesting that prolonged developmental trajectories may actually have positive uh, effects on cognitive development. So how is all of this relevant to cerebral palsy? So first of all, I think that by understanding normal variation in neurodevelopment across diverse populations and global populations, we'll be better able to understand altered neurodevelopment in neurological disorders, um, either genetic or acquired due to environmental factors. Also, the molecular pathways that we reveal could actually be therapeutic targets for neurodevelopmental disorders. You know, particularly, I, that's why I wanted to highlight the white matter findings and the DTI findings. Uh, we also think that probably genes and environmental factors identified by origin could be considered either as matching criteria, covariate, or effect modifiers for inclusion in neuroimaging studies of cerebral palsy in this age range. And finally, as I said, you know, we hope this is a a model that can be expanded upon. So even though we're focusing on um, kind of population representative samples and normal development for the most part, uh, we eventually want to extend beyond that uh, to look at neurological conditions in this critical key early age range. So hopefully I've kept to time more or less there. This is our team and collaborators, uh, my wonderful team here at MSU and our collaborators and the many members of Origins. And also my two very beautiful children who inspire everything I do. <laughs>